Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Reach Your Target Data ROI with Localization-Ready Content Practices. My name is Marianne Kalahana. I'm the Vice President of Marketing for Data Conversion Laboratory, and I will be your moderator today. Before we get started, I want to let you know we will allow time at the end of the webinar for Q&A, so please submit your questions in the dialog box as they come to mind. If we don't have time to answer all the questions, we will get in touch with you personally after this webinar. And also, this webinar is being recorded. Today's agenda includes introductions to our panelists and their organizations so that you can understand their expertise in both data and localization. Next, we are going to open a couple quick polls to assess where you and your organization stand with the topic. And then we'll dive deep into the reason you are all here with us today, localization ROI considerations and metrics. We are fortunate to have with us today um, two experts in the topic of data and localization. We have Christopher Hill from Data Conversion Laboratory. Chris has a long history with structured content, data, XML, and other types of conversion projects. We also have Dominique Truche. He is the CEO of WHP. He is also a data expert helping documentation teams of leading technology groups publish future-ready content. Thank you both for putting this program together for us today. And now I'd like to turn it over to Chris Hill from Data Conversion Laboratory. Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Marianne. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with Data Conversion Laboratory, let me just take a second and uh, give you kind of a really big picture of what we do. So. Uh, as you can tell by our name, uh, we provide data and content transformation services. That's the data conversion part and uh, solutions around that. So we've really evolved uh, over several decades of, uh, of using uh, a lot of innovations in the computer industry to accomplish this goal. Uh, and that includes a lot of artificial intelligence technologies like machine learning, some natural language processing, whatever it really takes uh, to help businesses organize and structure the data and content they uh, need for today's modern platforms and technologies. Um, we work across a number of industries. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you look at this slide, this kind of covers, there's a lot of information here, but this covers the breadth of what we do. So it really isn't just uh, data conversion, there's a lot around that in, in today's age of content that uh, accompany that. And that might include metadata enrichment. Uh, we may be extracting uh, information uh, from content that already exists, uh, harvesting data, doing quality assurance on, on the content uh, that is created. Uh, and then, of course, uh, around the data topic, we do a lot with structured content delivery and content reuse. So that really is where we intersect with uh, this topic. Um, and we work across a lot of industries. We have uh, quite a huge portfolio. I mean, we go back to the 80s. So that gives you some idea of, uh, of how many organizations we've encountered over the years. This is just a small set of them, but it gives you an idea of, of kind of the verticals that we've served over the years and, and continue to serve as well as some of the, the big customers that we have in those verticals. Uh, so I'd like uh, now Dominique to uh, tell us a little bit about what he does at WHP. Yeah, good morning, and uh, I'm Dominic. So for those who are wondering my, where my friend, my accent is coming from, so I'm French and living in Canada. So uh, WHP, we are a language service provider. We're serving Global Technology Group. We've been serving Global Technology Group for 25 years, uh, mainly us focusing on technical documentation, so starting with SGML, XML, and for the last 15 years on uh, working with data. 
So for uh, around data, we provide localization services, uh, so multilingual localization services with a lot of subject matter expertise uh, to, to the customers. So that's where we, we started uh, some 15 years ago. And then for the last four or five years, uh, we've been uh, adding consulting services because we've been uh, supporting customers in setting up better best practices in uh, in help them improving the content and they ask us to come and, and help them a little bit further. So we work with them to optimize their content, to optimize their processes, whether the content processes or the localization processes, and then we help them as well on content migration, I would say beyond what uh, DCL is doing, we help the customer migrate into uh, from their data content to their data localization ready content. And then we also have designed technology uh, for uh, at the very beginning for our own services. So we have designed a data layer on top of what we call the TMS, which is a transition management system. And uh, this data layer copes with a lot of uh, data specificities and uh, automated workflows and linguistic quality control. So this technology was designed for ourselves at the very beginning. And uh, now we are also uh, setting it up for uh, several customers. So we, we address uh, different markets. You can see on, on the left, so IT telecom, software publishers, life science, industrial automation, energy and transportation. And you can see this is, this is the, 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 the adoption uh, rate of DITA, actually. DITA was started uh, some, some 15, uh, 16 years ago with IT telecom and software publishers, then life science and medical device especially, then uh, uh, industrial automation. And we are now in uh, most of our new coming customers are in transportation and energy. Uh, that's where we stand. And uh, on the on the right hand side, you've got the services. So uh, there's one one label has uh, as, uh, as been skipped. It's about software, but uh, we do uh, we localize documentation and software for uh, run run data. Uh, in some in, in some industries, we've got product labeling as well, which is also managed with data, and more and more growing growing training content managed with data as well. Great. Uh, so before we dive into the, the meat of this uh, presentation, uh, let's get our viewers involved and have a quick poll here. Uh, so we're curious about where you currently stand regarding DITA. And you can just choose uh, whatever answer best fits your organization from this list. I'll give you uh, half a minute or so to answer this, and then uh, we'll share some results. Chris, I can see a couple of people are still, we're still collecting a couple of responses, so we'll give it just another minute, and um, we're really yeah, no looking, uh, yeah, we're just asking our um, attendees to select the answer that really aligns the best with your organization. Okay, I see that most folks have submitted, so I am going to close the poll, and I'm going to share the results. Great. Looks like uh, a lot of people are thinking about DITA, which uh, is uh, my experience as well. So that's the majority here. But I'm pleased to see that there's uh, a substantial number of attendees who are using DITA and are, are satisfied. So that's great to hear. Um, I think if we'd have done this poll about five years ago, the results would be very different. Uh, but uh, things are evolving in the content industry. It's good to see. Uh, so those are the results. So Dominique, yeah, uh, as a I local, think, I, think I, can, I can just oh, yeah. add on that. There's also something which is interesting is that uh, the, the first line is using for uh, data for years and planning a new model. That's a new trend we are seeing right now because the early adopters of data have been using data for seven, eight years. And, uh, and uh, many of them are now switching uh, to a new uh, next-gen project where they want to do more with DITA or, uh, or bet, uh, to work better than we used to work with DITA 1.1 some years ago. So I think it's, uh, it's significant. Yeah, that is uh, actually, that is good. I'm, I'm glad to see that too. I guess uh, we're just seeing an overall maturing of the, the DITA uh, projects and, and uh, use. 
So Dominique is a localization expert. What thoughts can you share with us for people who are either contemplating a move to DITA or are uh, evolving their DITA project? Okay, so we, we can see, so we've been, we've been working with plenty of, uh, plenty of different customers and uh, what, we, what we've seen is that DITA, DITA adoption, they, they, most of them have been, have been migrating to DITA. They have, uh, they, the DITA project has, has Pulled as a triggered by the documentation manager or documentation team that wants to use a standard, but uh, they have different objectives. They want to do be to be able to do more content reuse to improve the content, uh, the, the user experience, to have a better, more efficient content management, to have uh, there are plenty of other reasons, more more delivery channels, uh, easier on onboarding of new technical writers. Uh, plenty of different objectives. But when it comes to sell to selling this. Uh, uh, project to the C level uh, managers. Uh, they uh, these managers they want to see figures and commitment, and uh, the commitment from the documentation team to the C level is okay. On the long run, we'll do more with less. So we'll have more languages. We'll have more uh, more publishers, pub, uh, more publishing outputs, and things like that with less money. But for the time being, it won't change that much. Uh, all the rest, content reuse, user experience, uh, it's going to be soft factor. It's very difficult to factor in. And then what we can see is that 95% of the ROI uh, uh, sold to C level is quite exclusively based on cost savings in localization. Uh, and uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's really impressive uh, that uh, all these uh, ROI are exclusively based on localization, while to be to be honest, localization is hardly uh, really taken into account in uh, the adoption projects. Very often, it's considered as a, as a given that uh, once we'll be reusing, once we'll have less words, we'll have less uh, cost, and it's going to save a lot of a lot of money. That's basically the, the, what we can see from this ROI. So it's everything is, uh, let's say, is driven by localization. So I'm here to be the voice of localization and to see how, okay, how we all the ROI are based on localization. So how can we ensure that this ROI actually matched or reached? Yeah, great. So, so since you brought up the topic of localization, as I expected, <laughs> let's go ahead and ask our uh, viewers where they stand regarding localization. So again, uh, here's a short poll if you would just select one of these five answers. Uh, that best matches your organization or, or you with localization. Uh, and I'll give you a minute here to uh, get those answers in. And if you haven't answered yet, go ahead and just click one of the five that best aligns with your organization. And in a second here, we'll, we'll see if there's any uh, interesting trends in that result. I'm going to allow folks just another couple seconds. Uh, we're inching up to the same response rate as the first poll. So thank you all for your input. I'm now going to close the poll and share the results with everyone. Okay, so it looks like, uh, as I kind of expected, uh, the majority of the people on, on this uh, webinar are very interested in localization because they're actually uh, localizing to more than five languages, five or more languages. Uh, and uh, although there are a significant number, the number two results I see there is uh, that uh, they aren't doing localization right now, but likely will in the future. And, and I do see still a lot of that um, in, uh, across the uh, industry right now. Okay, so, okay, quite, quite, so quite interesting, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So Dominique, when I first moved to DITA, I know that there's a fairly substantial investment. I mean, that's one of the reasons that, you know, as you mentioned in the previous slide, uh, that I go to localization is one of the places to try to make an ROI case uh, for moving to DITA. Um, so maybe you can share with us some of your thoughts on, uh, you know, that, that initial investment and, and when to start expecting payoffs or, or uh, 
when people think they should expect payouts. Okay. Uh, so first of all, I want I want to share with uh, you all uh, a short survey that, uh, that we we performed with uh, 100 companies uh, recently. We asked those 100 companies, okay, you, have you reached your ROI? We've taken companies which had been migrating to data for more than uh, two years because the very first two years is very difficult to say exactly where we stand with the ROI. But you can see that. Um, let's say uh, three out of four actually claiming that they have not reached the ROI or not at all reach the ROI and uh, and that's quite I would say disappointing I would say uh, maybe it was because the ROI was uh, uh, expectations were too high but mostly it's, it's because uh, the, the, the way it was implemented didn't uh, didn't reach it so if you yeah Arian can you switch to the next one yeah, so basically we, we analyzed with those companies and uh, why this ROI was not reached. And uh, when I speak about ROI, uh, I also speak about turnaround time because in, in, in many instances, the turnaround time is as important for, for customers than ROI is actually. So we've been looking at the, why this, it, was, it was not achieved. And basically we, we found several reasons we want to share with you and you want to see uh, how it, uh, it it, it matches your 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 issues or your concern. So the first reason is that uh, uh, the content is very often is is redesigned. When people migrate to data, they they want to implement many changes they had in mind and that they didn't they didn't have time or didn't uh, uh, plan to to migrate. So they redesign the content. And of course, when you redesign the content, uh, since you are relying on transition memories. Uh, and your content was already well um, managed with transition memory. When you redesign the content, you have a lower leverage with transition memory and you can see an increase in the cost of localization, even though you might have less words. The second point is the, the low reuse. Uh, when you, you migrate your legacy content, uh, you migrate several documents and you might have different, uh, let's say, different paragraphs which are migrating to topics and you might have redundant topics. It's very difficult to actually see what, uh, what's a reuse and to, and to be able to, to, leverage, to, to leverage this, uh, this reuse uh, from, uh, from the former content. Another one, which is which can be seem, uh, uh, let's say, a small one, but it's, it can be very significant. It's the loss of transition memory leverage. When you migrate from a Word document or you migrate from FrameMaker document into Data, you change a little bit the format. You migrate the content to XML. Also, the PDF might be exactly the same. Uh, the structure of the content might be slightly different, and you might have inline tags, which are a little bit different. So when you go to localization, the transition memory might have a lower leverage. So you might lose 5 or 10% of leverage, but 5 or 10% when you localize into plenty of languages and you have a huge content might be very significant. Uh, and the last point we've seen there is that very often uh, customers over estimate the, val the, the value of legacy transition memory. They were working sometime, uh, from time to time with uh, plenty of vendors uh, with different transition memories, different setup and like that. When they put all of them together, uh, because they, they usually switch, when they switch to data, they switch to only one vendor because it's more, more complex and they, they, they channel all the uh, transition to one vendor. When we put all the transition memories together, they're not that uh, consistent and, uh, and there's some loss uh, in, in this uh, transition memory. So very often we can see customers which have expected or they have sold that they will have a decrease in the transition cost from very first year. They can see a significant increase of first year. So we had some customers where the increase was 70, 80 percent on the first uh, round of transition. Uh, fortunately, uh, all those are related to transition memories. And once it's been it's been run once in the transition memory, then uh, we get the, the actual leverage. So this short-term impact, which can be uh, rather significant, is as its name it is named is, is short-term. So once you you so, pass over that, it should be over. So it it sounds a bit like uh, when I uh, learned to advance my skiing, 
uh, I started off snow plowing, got quite good at that. And then for a while, while I was trying to switch to learn to parallel ski, I was falling down again and couldn't go down the same slopes I used to. Uh, I guess it's, uh, you know, when you're trying to make an advancement like this, there's always some of that short-term investment. So it, so it has to be considered as an investment. You have an investment when you migrate to DITA. You have an investment in training people, in setting up tools and things like that. You have to consider that's going to be an investment in your localization as well uh, because you decrease the efficiency of your transition memories. It's an, it has to be considered as an investment. But it should not be okay. forgotten. And it sounds like, uh, yeah, for sure that... Uh, that expectation should be set early on in the project so that you don't catch a lot of heat that first year as yeah. you, as you make that investment. I know some documentation manager which had some heat when they came and uh, to, to to their uh, C level and explained that uh, this, uh, instead of a uh, decrease in localization, we have an increase. So yeah, no, nobody wants to go to their bus with that for sure. Okay. So looking at the next uh, slide that you offer here, um, it sounds like uh, there's more to the move to data than just changing the format, right? It sounds like there's still some strategic uh, things that have to be taken into account. Yeah, especially when you think about localization and we think that your content will have to be localized. Uh, we, we analyze, uh, let's say, so, some impacts are coming, uh, some important impact uh, is coming from, uh, from the, the content, the information model and the content quality. As you can imagine, uh, the trans, uh, translator is translating the content which has been written by a technical writer. And of course, his, uh, his cost depends a lot on the way, on, on the content itself. <clears throat> so let's see how, the, how it, uh, it can impact. So first thing we've seen is that uh, the reuse uh, uh, was, uh, let's say, we had less reuse than expected because uh, sometimes the, uh, customers are missing the reuse strategy. It's important, you, uh, reuse is not coming by chance because you are using data. Reuse is coming because you are uh, having a, re, a reuse strategy and, and if you enforce this strategy. Uh, because very often we've seen uh, let's say technical writers which are a little bit too independent, do a missing style guide, missing a, a reuse strategy in order to be, to be able to, to share content. So that's, uh, that, that's quite important. Second one is the content update. Uh, and when you are, um, when you are maintaining uh, content, uh, in different languages, you might have a lot of updates which are coming, uh, software UI, product names, part numbers, and things like that, which are embedded in the software and which are out of control of a technical writer. And since more and more uh, the localization, localization technical writing comes, is, is, coming, is becoming agile, so the content is written more and more while the product itself is not stabilized. So there's far more maintenance to, to, be, to be doing on the, on the content side. And if, it's, if maintenance is not properly uh, supported by the content, it can be very uh, ex expensive. Just take an example. If you localize a, a software into, into, into several languages and you write the documentation of the software, which is to be localized, for instance, in Chinese. So if after a couple of months, someone wants to change the UI in Chinese, you have to go to all your documentation in languages, to your transition memories to update the UI, uh, UI term in, in, the, in the transition. And this can be very, very costly if you, uh, if you have a huge, uh, huge content. So the information model shall support uh, this uh, content maintenance. The third one, is someone which is very difficult to understand for most technical writers because they speak English and they uh, English is a very simple language and when you go to another language especially and when you have content for instance let's suppose you are using uh, you want to do reuse and you are using a lot of variables confs conkey refs whatever you uh, however you want to, to do it um, your sentence might be perfectly correct in one instance with one set of variables or conref, uh, but it can become completely wrong when you go to another conref because of uh, because in the target language, 
the noun could have a different gender or could have a different uh, way of, uh, of spelling depending on the on the case on the plural uh, and, uh, and just think about uh, a smartphone or uh, you have a, a one sentence where you speak about operating your smartphone your smartphone in in spanish is masculine but if you if you replace smartphone and say okay now let's talk about operating my iphone iphone in spanish is feminine so all the wording the articles the, the adjectives will be different so it's it's a uh, and it can you can write as technical writers content which is completely non translatable uh, it's not just because people won't like to do it, it's because it's not translatable or you won't be able to make sure, to ensure that whatever configuration the content will be right. So it's something which is rev very important to take into account when you write, uh, when you write uh, the content. Fourth one we see very often is graphics. You have graphics and uh, there's a saying that say, okay, one an image is worth 1,000 words. Uh, when it comes to localization, I would say an image is worth a thousand words as well. <laughs> so it's costing a lot <laughs> uh, because it's uh, uh, when you have to you have two types of, of image of graphics. Uh, one is called bitmaps, so the JPEG, PNGs. Uh, another one is uh, vectorial, and vectorial is usually when you think about vectorial, is usually we think about SVG. Uh, scalable vectorial graphics, but it's also EPS or CGM when we are working in a CAD environment. This vectorial format means that the text is available in for translation. Usually, there are XML files. SVG is actually an XML file, uh, so it means that the, the, the text is available for translation. is available as such in the in the file, so it's easy to to localize. When you go to bitmaps, you need to uh, find the original content, for instance, in Illustrator or Visio or another, any other tool, and then to, uh, to, to, make, to localize it and then to regenerate the PNG and, uh, of, a, of a JPEG. And we see very often that documentation is still embedding PNGs for graphics. Uh, of course, obviously, part of the graphics are screenshots. So, and screenshots are, by essence, uh, bitmaps. But there are there are still solutions around 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 screenshots. Uh, some of them more user friendly than others, but there are solutions on that. So, these uh, graphics can be can be a very significant part of a of a of a cost. Especially when you have, a, when you, you might have some DTP, uh, when you migrate to DITA, many people will tell you, okay, at least you get rid of DTP. But if you've got plenty of graphics and if you manage them in PNGs, you're gonna, you're gonna still have significant DTP for your, your project. Uh, then conditional content, more uh, reuse, very often uh, is, uh, is supported by conditional content. Um, we've seen uh, some of our customers are managing a, a, a huge set of conditions. One, uh, one of ours is managing at least uh, 200 conditions, depending on depending on the, on the on the content. And uh, the text, some uh, text is very complex to maintain because of conditions. Uh, it's very difficult for uh, to have sentences where part of sentences is changing depending on the conditions. So it's difficult to maintain in English, and it's very difficult to translate. That it can it can it can also it can also mean that the content is not translatable at all because you can have some uh, the, the same thing as as a, a non-translatable structure. You can you can end up with content which, depending on conditions, will not work. So it's extremely uh, complex to to translate. So there's a simple recommendations: do not conditionalize part of sentences, conditionalize sentences, or uh, or, or data elements. Uh, it's even better. I appreciate that sometimes you cannot conditionalize uh, data elements when you think about title or or CMD, where you can only have one. But then at least conditionalize uh, the sentences within this uh, sentence level. Then there are many others, uh, and uh, I'm pretty uh, I'm pretty confident every time we work with a new customer, we'll find a new uh, a new potential issue. Um, for hardware suppliers, 
measurement units might be an issue. You might know that the US uh, or yeah, United States and part of uh, and Canada is using a measurement system which is not the metric system. And uh, when you localize to other countries, uh, the measurement units have to be converted. Uh, it's, it should not be left, left to the translators to convert these measurement units into others. Uh, there should be some, some ways to do it a little bit better to make sure that, uh, to, to, be, to, be, uh, to ensure that uh, the translation and, and the localization in the, in, for different countries will be uh, consistent and reliable. Another uh, re requirement that we see more and more now is the accessibility. Uh, in the US, there's a lot of requirements now, a lot of RFPs require that documentation is compliant with the Accessibility Act, uh, which usually means that every single, uh, there are plenty of, uh, let's say, the, the book is thick, is uh, four or five centimeters thick when you print it. But it's about, it's about uh, very often it, uh, it means for technical documentation, it means uh, that every single image has to have alt text in order to be, to be read by screen readers. And this alone has an impact, a significant impact in localization if you are using icons within sentences, because then you have alt text embedded into, into a sentence. So it's, uh, it makes it more more difficult. So, Plenty of, of small things like that. Formatting. Uh, I'm personally uh, lobbying the, 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 the commit, technical committee of DITA to, to cancel the bold, italic, and any formatting elements from DITA. Uh, because these are, are very difficult to, to, to translate for several reasons. Uh, first, Think about uh, a traditional Chinese um, character printed in Italic bold, how it's going to look like, uh, or Arabic language, how it's going to look an Arabic uh, character in Italic. It doesn't work. But then for the translation, it also means that the translator, when he's translating a content which has been set to Italic by a technical writer, he knows that this content is translating is special. But it doesn't know why. It doesn't know to what uh, it should be consistent. So if there's something that is italic, the technical writer has put it in italic on purpose. So it should be mentioned clearly why it's been put into italic. It should be because it might be because it's a warning, because it's a system input. It might be so it might be tagged correct. It might be tagged with a semantic tag uh, if available with data. If it's significant, there might be, it might deserve a specialization. But if it's not uh, that significant to deserve a specialization, maybe a simple output class that will be managed by your, your CSS will be, will be able to, to fulfill your requirements and will certainly help the localization. So there are plenty of others. Uh, so you've seen the three dots eventually, it's basic, because basically we, uh, we have a we have a list of uh, maybe 200 tricks uh, we have identified with different customers, and therefore every single data instance we can find other other tricks for localization. So this this uh, all what I mentioned here lies in the information model. So whatever the the, the, the technical writer is writing, it might uh, make it uh, difficult. But but even when the information model is correct. Uh, the content quality is, is very important, and um, it's very important that you have style and terminology consistency, and that you enforce it. Uh, it's, uh, there should be style guides uh, for technical writers, and these style guides should be improved on a regular basis. So what we strongly recommend is to make sure that uh, we have some rules, uh, that can be enforced. So you can have some tools like uh, Acrolinks, Congri, or many others uh, on the offering level, but you have some simple rules that you can set up, some schematron rules that you can implement to make sure uh, to, to implement some simple rules. One, one rule we are supplying for free is, uh, uh, is uh, sentence length control. If you have a sentence which is 50 words, it's going to take 
four, four times more to translate than a sentence which is 25 words. So when you multiply a sentence, a number of words by two, you multiply the cost by four. So the, and the, I guess for, for content maintenance, it's, it's, it's a similar uh, metric. So a lot of, a lot of uh, rules should be, should be implemented and best practices among technical writers. And we strongly advocate, and we have set up for several customers, we strongly advocate for uh, data peer review. Many, uh, let's say, when you are doing software design, you have, um, uh, you set up peer review between uh, developers to make sure that the code is, uh, is, is written the same way and some quality is, is, is enforced. You should, I believe we should do the same for technical writers uh, and to have these, uh, these people reviewing the, the, the way they write data among themselves and not just uh, uh, to, uh, to have a review of the published output. And this is this would be worth uh, a lot of uh, a lot of money because there's going to be a, a significant reuse of a, of a content and transition and and transitions afterwards if you impl implement that. So these these rules uh, short term are, are basically the most most important uh, uh, rules that you need to implement on your on your content to make sure that it's going to be localization friendly. Great. Now, now you've talked a lot about the content here, and that's great. Uh, what about the localization process? What are some of the issues that we need to be aware of when, when we're translating XML and data content as opposed to just translating, say, plain text? Yeah, there, there, are, there are, of course, uh, once the content is perfect, then you need to have a perfect process uh, to, to manage this content. Um, the first thing we found we found in in a localization process is uh, when people are migrating to data is that there's an explosion of a number of files. When you have one single word file or one single framemaker project, uh, when you go to data, sometimes you've got 400, 500 files. Uh, we've got uh, customers which has up to 7,000 uh, topics for one document. Uh, so, and of course, uh, then you cannot, uh, it cannot be handled manually any longer. It has to be, uh, you need to have some kind of uh, uh, servers with a workflow, with a proper file management. You just cannot uh, track uh, the progress on an Excel table and, uh, and work with a, with a desktop uh, uh, transition, uh, transition management system. Uh, and this is this is quite uh, quite quite, uh, quite Im important. It might be it might be very significant. The second we've seen is uh, let's say LSPs or, or LSP stands for localization service provider or language service providers. Uh, some of them which are not data aware. Uh, this can end up. Um, this can end up in in uh, incorrect un settings of a, of, a, of a TMS. I think there's there's a, there are a couple of rules which are which are rather important to to identify if your if your LSP is data aware. You uh, if you ask them, uh, do you know about data? And if the answer is yes, it says yes, we know about data. It's just an average XML. You better worry. And if I tell you yes, we know about data. Uh, can you send us a PDF as well? Uh, so these are two indications that, uh, although it claims to be data aware, is, is it might not be that much data aware. So this can lead into uh, to uh, uh, to improper segmentation, can lead to uh, tags which are not properly managed. Uh, whether inline tags or out uh, or a segmentation or element tags. Uh, it can be to content which is not properly filtered. So at the, at the, the worst case is that you're going to pay a little bit more to match. Uh, the, in the bad uh, worst case, uh, you can have content which does not publish correctly. And that's, uh, of course, or you have, a, you have a lot of exception handling afterwards to make sure that when it's delivered, um, it's, uh, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to work in your, in your CMS or in your uh, environment, whether, whether Git or whatever. Uh, so that can, be, that can lead to, uh, and then what's happening as well very often is that when you migrate to DITA, 
you are in a uns, you are in a change management process you are in some kind of a unsafe situation and if you're if you have to train at the same time your lsp into data to how to manage it uh, you're going to be in a in a in an even uh, more difficult situation while if you work with a data competent lsp this data competent lsp will help you and will help you stabilize or or make sure your your process is properly under control so instead of being a help it's going to be it's going to be it's going to create problems so this uh, this is quite important third one is a little bit uh more um unexpected i would say for for many of our customers um but, uh, in many regulated industries so, no, sorry. In many industries, especially regulated industry, you have to ensure that your content is reviewed once translated. But someone, a subject matter, what we call a local subject matter expert or in-country reviewer, someone that can speak the target language, is reviewing the content once translated. What's be, what was usually done when we're talking about uh, word framework documentation, unstructured, uh, I would say, unstructured content? is that usually they, uh, the, the subject, local subject matter experts were reviewing the PDF and they were able to make changes and, uh, and then to, to, to finalize the PDF afterwards. When we get to DITA, uh, uh, you, you cannot expect the local SMEs to be able to review the, 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 the XML content, the DITA content. So you, if you expect them to review a PDF, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be too late because it means that this, the transition memory have been set up. It means that it's been delivered in the CMS. Then you have a, you will have a complete workflow. Someone making a change, sending it back to the translator, so that the translator delivers again. And uh, so there's a lot of exchanges there, uh, which is uh, which can damage the turnaround time and damage the uh, the, 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 the ROI. So this is this is really to be taken seriously into account. So how do you perform the linguistic review once you migrate to uh, once you have migrated to to DITA or to any any structured content? It's it's valid as well if you are using any other XML, including S1000D. Uh, you you will have the same you will have the same uh, issue on linguistic review, and it shall not be underestimated. It's it's true for language for regulated industry where you have to commit that it's going to be done. For other industries, you can claim, okay, well, I'm working in software; it doesn't really matter. Uh, linguistic, let's say, we can we can afford having no linguistic review. The point is that if you let your LSP work without any review for several years, uh, you can expect that the the, the 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 eventual quality will will decrease. So you need you you cannot let your your uh, your LSP work without any any control on your side, otherwise it's going to be it's it's going to be striking back sooner or later. So the linguistic review is is an important is an important part of a uh, of, 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 of And then uh, last point is the DT, DTD and schema compliance. It's surprising, but uh, even the best in class. Uh, LSPs, which are uh, uh, well aware of data and things like that, uh, they usually have 90%. Uh, uh, very, they quite never have 90% over 90% right first time delivery. So it means that 10% of the project which are delivered are not publishing, for for plenty of reasons. Uh, it might be, let's say, it can be uh, most of the TMS check and ensure that the content which is delivered is XML compliant. But it can be fully XML compliant, but not compliant with your DTD. Uh, take an example: uh, you have the menu cascade element. Menu cascade element is a is a is a is a list of UI control. Let's suppose someone adds a, a character to match. So, for instance, a space in between the UI controls. It's going to be fully XML compliant. It will not publish in data. And it will not publish in your data, especially. So these are the type of things which are impossible to uh, to prevent, even by filtering the content, and it can lead to uh, un 
and consistent so to content which is not consistent and compliant with your your DTD or thing. And every time a project is delivered which is not con compliant, it means that you have an exception to handle. You have to come back to your LSPs and say, hey, this file doesn't work, and can you please check and correct and uh, and so forth. So it can be can be significant as well in terms of. Uh, in terms of uh, duration, in terms of um, uh, of cost. Okay. Well, now that you there, there might yeah, be a couple ahead. of others as well that I just mentioned in 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 the in the slide. When you go for publishing as well, you might have when you use the Open Toolkit, you might have some treats as well coming there from different languages. But these mm -hmm. are the main these are the main points. There are plenty of others, of course. So uh, you familiarize us with a lot of issues there, and there's a lot to think about with that. Uh, that leaves us wondering now, what's really, uh, how much is at stake here, and, and are there some tips you can give us to help us navigate uh, these waters? Okay, so first, uh, so first, yeah. Uh, so how can I, how how do we start? So uh, I think I I I I hope I, I I give you some some ideas, some tips about things that can can go wrong or should be can be can go better. So how do how do you address them? So I think it's not uh, best. There cannot be a list of all the all the tips because it might not be relevant. If we were to implement all of them, it would be too much too much uh, an effort. So basically, what you need to implement uh, this type of, uh, let's say, process of improving your content, you need a little bit of data expertise. You need a little bit of localization expertise, and you need you need a huge bit of common sense. And uh, I guess if you are listening this uh, to this webinar, it's because you have already some common sense and you realize that you were. <laughs> it, it would be interesting to to to, to learn. Uh, so common sense is, uh, but uh, yeah. And if you believe you 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 are gonna find you're gonna find very very soon all all the tricks that uh, that uh, are relevant for your content. But if you want to save time, of course, uh, DCL experts or WHP experts, we are ready to help you on that. But what's what's at stake, and that's that's surprising. Usually, when we're doing this type of uh, let's say benchmark with uh, with our customers, uh, usually what we we have also they might be working in plenty of different industries. We've been doing for uh, medical device, for pharmaceutical companies, for companies which have been using data for a long time. Some companies uh, more recently, software publishers, and things like that. We very often come back to the same uh, order magnitude. We identified this 30% efficiency, uh, which is available in, in, in quick wins. Uh, when I say efficiency, I mean uh, return on investment uh, or turnaround time, uh, effort, cost of vendor. You, you will find this 30% a little bit everywhere. And it's in quick wins. Very often, it's it's something that's uh, very simple. So just as a uh, one example is uh, instead of saving as PNG, you save as SVG. And, uh, and you're gonna, you might save already five or ten percent just by doing that. Uh, so it's, these are the type of things that are uh, significant, very significant. Then usually we have another twenty percent, uh, which is available uh, on the longer run. Uh, just by um, it might be more consistent. It might be implementing tools for offering. It might be uh, working on uh, working on terminology. It might be uh, uh, setting up some specialization of the, uh, or or managing more output classes in publishing. So it, it, those twenty percent might be uh, only available on longer run. So it's. It, it's more, it's they are more difficult to reach. But this 30% 30, 30 efficiency in quick wins, I'm I'm ready to bet uh, whoever is is listening that if we if we work with you, we're going to find this uh, easily with you this 30%. Or if you work, you're going to find this uh, this 30% uh, very very easily. That's um great. So looking a bit further down the road, then, uh, and we, you know, we, you mentioned this actually when we did the DITA poll at the beginning of how uh, some people are in their next generation of DITA. Uh, so uh, looking down the road, what trends do you see ahead? Okay, so the trends there are there are, um, there are several several trends. One, the most Common and I mentioned already, it's not it's not even a, it's not even a trend. It's something which is happening. It's agile 
uh, agile content uh, management. Can you switch to the next one, uh, Marianne? There might be another slide. Yeah. So agile agile content management. Um, let's say this is coming from software industry. Software industry, software agile agile software design is becoming the standard. It's no longer is no longer a question. It's the standard. So 90 90 percent of the software company are working agile. In the documentation offering, it's becoming more and more common. Uh, so uh, very often now, the, the technical writer is embedded in the in the Scrum team uh, designing the software, and uh, so and we can see that happening as well for the for the hardware uh, design. And of course, there's the same requirement for for uh, for localization, content localization. So we can see that for um, uh, for instance, uh, for many software companies, we have helped them migrate from uh, sim ship, sim, uh, simultaneous shipment in different languages from uh, free four months to three weeks. Uh, so it's uh, and it's it's rather uh, rather important. Uh, the second is embedding uh, is taking into account documentation as as part of a product. Uh, when you design the UI, designing the documentation, uh, design to have the contextual help uh, in the in uh, in the product, uh, co completely integrate the, the, the software, uh, the documentation, and the in the in the product design itself. Last part, and uh, it's uh, documentation offering beyond. Uh, I think documentation is not a, is, it shouldn't have been the, the, the right word here. It's content offering beyond documentation. Uh, we can see many many companies who said, okay, now documentation. We are managing our documentation in data. So what's next? And we can see many more type of content. Um, we've got some customers uh, I mentioned which are doing uh, multimedia and training content with the learning and training specialization, which as part uh, from uh, DITA 1.3 on was uh, has been included in DITA standard. Uh, but we can see we can see as well maybe WHP on our side, for instance, our commercial proposal are written in DITA. Uh, so sales people are, are writing their documentations in their commercial proposals in, in data. So we can see, for instance, law firms which are doing, uh, which are working, uh, building their documentation in data. And now uh, we see more and more requests around around multimedia, and that's something we'll uh, uh, we are working on. So we're, uh, how to make sure videos. Uh, from document from the documentation, or to make sure that the video is localized uh, at the same time, it's uh, it's at the same time the content is localized. So that's for content, and we can see in localization that we have a we have a request to go more and more uh, more and more languages. So we can see customers, plenty of customers that say, okay, we we will not localize everything; will be in English. Uh, sooner or later, they they come and say, hey, now we we have a we have a special agreement contract with one customer and we need to to have it done or uh, we've been acquired uh, plenty of uh, plenty of things so I've seen at the very beginning a couple of people that claim that uh, their content will never be translated it's it would be worth challenging <laughs> <laughs> never say never right <laughs> yeah <definitely. laughs> Definitely. Well, thank you, uh, Dominique. This has been really informative for me, I know, and hopefully uh, for our audience. Do you have any final closing thoughts? Uh, we should. No, I, I think I think it's a it's a um, I'd say I'm I'm been working in language industry and that's that's a wonderful that's a wonderful industry because uh, you have so many nuances. It's very difficult to to anticipate all the issues. So we have we have plenty of issues, plenty of tricks we discover, and that's the beauty of our business. Great. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn this back over to Marianne, and we'll see if we have some questions from the audience. I think we still have a few minutes left. We do. And we do have a few questions. Um, let's see if we can get through a couple of these. Um, so one of the first ones is, do we need a CCMS, a component content management system, if we are localizing into many languages? Yeah, it's, it's, very, it's a question which is coming uh, rather often. Uh, Vera, you, you will need to you will need at some point to to manage uh, to manage dependencies between languages uh, the content into into different languages um, 
it, you don't need, I, I know large companies uh, which are working with CCMS, but it's worth considering a CC, uh, CCMS. It, it might save you, uh, save you um, uh, effort in, 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 in managing the, the, the links and the dependencies of all the, the topics and different languages. It's adding, a look, when you localize, it's adding another dimension on your, on your control and, uh, and managing the, with, uh, with the CCMS would certainly be, be worth. I'm I'm not a CCMS vendor, so I cannot I, I will not tell you which one. Um, they I believe the, the prices are uh, are not that high compared to to value, so I, it's it's worth considering. But it, it but it's not mandatory. Uh, uh, if you have a if you have a proper LSP, the LSP will be able to manage your content even if it's not coming from a CCMS, which is filtering the the content. So we can see very sizable customers using Git. Uh, very often, especially software publishers, it's it's very popular there. Right. Um, so here's one: how how long can can you give us a range of how long it would typically take to migrate from a framemaker based authoring tool to Dita? Oh, I think it's, it's it's more it's a question for you as well. So it's uh, I, I think the question the answer is very simple. So it it depends. <laughs> <laughs> It depends on the volume, of course. It depends on uh, how you how you want to achieve. I think uh, usually the projects are, are in the range of, uh, of uh, we are talking about a couple of quarters, uh, in between a couple of quarters to one year. So, uh, Chris, maybe you can you can uh, answer that as well. Um, so it, it's a little bit depending on, of course, on the size of on the number of uh, on on the, on the volumes you ha you're having. Yeah. Yeah, I would echo that. And for sure, it it varies widely. Um, uh, and and I think one of the things that I have often seen in the past is people underestimate a lot of the softer issues that you uh, brought up earlier. So they focus a lot on on what it takes technically to move, you know, the the content itself and and train people on the software. Uh, yeah. But I, I really like yeah. that you highlighted a lot of the things. Uh, but, uh, just the uh, way I author uh, and what I write has to change too. Yeah, one one of the challenges obviously is the training of the people is uh, let's say change management, and uh, you you shall not forget that these people still have to deliver at the same time. So the technical writers they have to deliver <laughs> to maintain the former content while investing in the new structure. So it's uh, very often challenging in terms of manpower and, uh, this this transition. All right. I'm going to, I think we'll end with um, this one question that's is sort of my favorite. Uh, are, are there languages that are more problematic than others? Oh, yes. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all of them have a different uh, reason to be problematic. Uh, if you go for uh, Latin languages like French, uh, Spanish, and Italian, uh, one of the main challenges is the text expansion. So you might have graphics uh, that will overlap some tables that do not format properly uh, properly in different languages. When you go to German, you will have the uh, compound words which are very difficult to hyphenate very often. Uh, when you go to Arabic, you might, or Hebrew, you might know that they are right to left, so it might be challenging for publishing right to left languages uh, in your environment. When you localize into Asian languages, uh, they have uh, different alphabets or sometimes not none uh, at all. So they don't, uh, the, the notion of acronyms doesn't exist in Japanese or Korean. Or if you want to, if you go to Chinese, for instance, uh, you won't be able to sort. Uh, there's no alphabetic order because there's no characters. So there are some workarounds. Uh, if you go to Finnish, and that's my favorite, and uh, when I mentioned that uh, uh, it's difficult to build accurate uh, uh, sentences if you have uh, conref or conkiref. In in Finnish, you might have 18 forms of some adjectives, depending on the genders, depending on the cases, depending on the plurals. So uh, the chances that uh, something very simple in English will be correct in Finnish are significantly uh, very low. So every single language is having its own uh, uh, its own uh, challenge, and uh, it's worth knowing them upfront.
Very interesting. Thank you. Um, and I think that really reinforces why, work, why working with um, organizations who have this kind of experience is really key to your success. Well, I want to thank you gentlemen very much for your time. I want to thank everyone who's taken time out of your busy day uh, to join us um, at this webinar. Uh, this now concludes today's broadcast. You can access many other webinars related to content structure, XML standards, DITA, and more from the webinar ar archive section um, from our website at dataconversionlaboratory.com. We do hope to see you at future webinars and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much, everyone.